I'm a scientist and I'm so I'm extremely excited about my science. I think it's one of the most interesting things in the world. So of course I want to share it. Welcome back to Inside Science Conversations. I'm your host, Chris Gorski. I'm the senior editor at Inside Science, a science news website published by the American Institute of Physics. This is our show about what makes scientists tick, what makes them do what they do, and what drives them to do more, to push at the frontiers of knowledge. Today on Inside Science Conversations, our guest is Nicole Younger-Halpern, a physicist at both NIST and the University of Maryland, who's written a book that's coming out in April called Quantum Steampunk, The Physics of Yesterday's Tomorrow. I'm really excited to talk to you. Thanks for uh, joining me, Nicole. Thanks so much for the invitation. It's great to be here. Can you tell us about your background picture? Definitely. So I was approached by an actual steampunk artist who asked if I would be interested in collaborating on a quantum steampunk sculpture. This artist is Bruce Rosenbaum, and he makes large scale kinetic interactive sculptures that are steampunk in style. And he saw a talk of mine and reached out. I thought, I have never done anything like this before, but it sounds like fun. So we settled on a depiction of a quantum engine. So in the center here is a platform on which there's an, a quantum engine formed from a trapped ion. Then the outer part of the sculpture shows the classical version of this engine. And this spherical structure is supposed to invoke an armillary sphere. And so uh, the, the feel of a few centuries ago so ideally, this will be um, life size, maybe about the size of a person. Um, he, we, we work together with an illustrator with whom Bruce has worked in the past. So the illustrator created this design, and now we're looking for funding to try to turn it into reality. Thanks. Um, so I wanted to start by kind of saying, when you were 10 or 12 years old, was science something you were interested in? Yes, with the caveat that I was interested in everything. So I loved all my classes from science and math to history, social studies, English. So I wanted to study everything. And I eventually found out that by doing physics, I could, in a sense, study everything. I interface with math and the history of physics, and uh, I communicate my work. I also get to interact with computer science and chemistry. So there is a lot of diversity even within the field of physics. And so when you're that age, you are just taking everything in? What Are you pointing in one direction or another? Or it's just like, give me everything you got? I really enjoyed everything I was learning in school. And I enjoyed reading books of many different types. But I just wanted to keep learning as much as I could. I read a, a post on your blog where you talked about uh, the value of a liberal arts education. So it sounds like that's always been kind of a, a passion of yours is to understand a little bit about everything and see where that takes you. Yes, I've very much been grateful for my liberal arts education. But I was grateful to try many different fields in high school and also in college. So I, in particular in college, didn't just major in physics. I actually refused to uh, major in any one discipline, but I was very fortunate to be at a school, Dartmouth College, where the professors helped me put together a major that incorporated multiple disciplines. So my major was called Physics Modified, and it involved a number of ordinary physics courses, but also some math, philosophy, and history, so I could get different perspectives on the discipline. And it was just after I finished that sort of well-rounded look uh, of physics from multiple different angles that I decided physics was what I wanted to focus on and go into in great depth in graduate school. Do you, I mean, physics has a long tradition of people who are able, who, who have a lot of interests, right? Who look at the world from a certain way and want to apply their minds to, to so many things. Do you see yourself as part of that tradition? Yes, absolutely. 
I think or in my experience, different people come to physics with for different reasons and with um, different types of excitation in mind. Some people just think lasers are really cool. They want to play with lasers in a lab for five years. And I can totally understand that. I think that lasers are cool too. But what really brought me to physics is the tradition of natural philosophy behind physics. So I also um, am fascinated by a lot of the world. And I appreciate having a physicist's toolkit to be able to think about different facets of it. And also to use tools from different disciplines to look at physics itself. What was it that eventually clinched it for you to go into kind of graduate school in physics and pursue it as a career? In part, it was a history of physics course taught senior year of college, my final semester or term, because we have quarters at Dartmouth. The final term I was in college, I took a wonderful history of physics course taught by Marcelo Gleiser. So he is a physicist, he's a cosmologist. He also has done a lot um, in terms of writing and engaging the public that involves bringing in other perspectives, so history and philosophy. So he taught this great history of physics class that I really enjoyed. I learned a ton. I worked really hard. Some of the topics I had seen in my ordinary physics courses, and I really enjoyed seeing them again, and I enjoyed the historical perspectives. And I also enjoyed interacting with the other people in the class. It turned out that I was the only physics student in the class. I was the only student who belonged as a part of my major or as really the core of my major to the physics department. And I saw the way that I understood these topics, having uh, uh, an almost physics major background. And I saw how other students in the course engaged with the topics. And um, everyone was getting out of the course what they needed. But I just realized that if I were to engage with physics at the level of someone who didn't belong to physics, then I wouldn't be satisfied. So I really enjoyed um, being able to engage in the course as someone who has a more rigorous background. And I wanted more of a rigorous background and I wanted to encounter more topics that I hadn't gotten to in my major, such as particle physics and relativity and so on, from that true physics perspective. Was there something in particular that drew you to the quantum side of physics? And, and you know, the very small things and what's happening at that, at that level? Yes. So I've always had philosophical inclinations, and these were uh, encouraged by a wonderful teacher I had in high school who taught me philosophy. He taught in particular a metaphysics course. And he, as he very well admitted, did not know physics and especially didn't know the math behind it. But he was fascinated by some of the paradoxes in physics. So through him, I learned a little bit about some of the paradoxes in quantum theory and special relativity and just how these theories of physics completely change our views of the world. And then I read some books for the general public about these subjects and was fascinated. I was really drawn in. So I wanted to understand this material better. I wanted to become familiar with these strange perspectives on the world because I really wanted to understand the world from a metaphysics perspective, having these philosophical inclinations. Quantum theory, especially quantum information theory, which is one of my specialties, occupies a wonderful position in science at the border of foundations and applications. On the one hand, quantum information is useful for quantum technologies, such as quantum computers. On the other hand, there are these wonderful quantum theory paradoxes. And using the tools of information science, we can analyze them anew and come to understand the nature of the universe better as quantum theorists or quantum information scientists. So that's why I was drawn to this subject. Neat. Now, how did you combine that with this sort of Jules Verne 1800s era 
steampunk idea to bring these seemingly really wildly different worlds together. It was also at the end of college that I became aware of this intersection between quantum physics, this information science, and thermodynamics, the study of energy, which had developed during the Victorian era, the 1800s, when people were, for the first time, using steam engines on a large scale in the Industrial Revolution. So I found I was trying to figure out what to do, where to go for grad school. So I talked to some professors of mine who had experience with quantum information theory, and they suggested looking at these professors' websites or those professors' websites. So I started identifying on these websites some keywords that really excited me and some paper topics that excited me. And then I just went around and looked for these terms. And I found that there's this wonderful community of people who think about the paradoxes of quantum theory and information theory, as I mentioned earlier, and also think about this thermodynamics of the 1800s. And these two fields are have very similar spirits. Both of them involve the concept of information and uncertainty. So entropy is a concept that shows up in quantum physics, in information science, and in thermodynamics. Uh, for instance, entropy is famously in the second law of thermodynamics, which helps us understand the arrow of time, why time flows in only one direction. I loved this very foundational, fundamental way of thinking, which also on the flip side, as I mentioned before, has applications such as to quantum computing. And I was especially intrigued by entropy, which tied all these fields together, because you can write down the mathematical form of something that we would call an entropy. And it looks kind of funny. It has all these very particular pieces put together in a very particular way. So it looks kind of awkward to tell the truth, the mathematical form of an entropy. You can understand it. And I explain in my book why this does have the form that it has. It does make sense once you think about it, but it does look kind of awkward. But on the other hand, it's, it's so fundamental and so important to the entire universe because, again, it helps us understand why time flows in just one direction. So I was fascinated by the tension between uh, those two perspectives on entropy, and um, I really liked the flavor of this information way of thinking. So that's how I made my way to the intersection of quantum physics, information science, and thermodynamics. Then suddenly early in grad school, I realized that this field, what we call quantum thermodynamics often, has the same flavor as steampunk. The steampunk is this genre of literature, art, and film. It juxtaposes Victorian settings with futuristic technologies like time machines. You mentioned Jules Verne. He was one of the earliest steampunk writers. Captain Nemo's ship is a steampunk technology. So this field um, has this wonderful sense of adventure together with nostalgia. And quantum information theory, uh, or the intersection of quantum theory and information science is cutting edge science. And it is partially futuristic because we don't have large scale quantum computers yet. They're currently being built in labs. And thermodynamics was developed during the 1800s, during the Industrial Revolution, so it is Victorian. The quantum thermodynamics really is the real world version of steampunk, which is why I came up with this term quantum steampunk to describe what we do in this field. So are you creating fantastical machines that can do futuristic things? Is that what you're up to? We do think about machines. There's there are many different subfields of this discipline of quantum thermodynamics. One of them is quantum thermal machines. So we do ask questions like, if you, what would a quantum engine look like? How could it perform? And there are, again, really strange features of quantum physics that don't show up in the everyday world. Listeners might have heard the words superposition or entanglement. And we know that these features of the quantum world can be useful in performing information processing tasks like solving uh, certain computational problems on a quantum computer. So a quantum com computer can solve certain problems much more quickly than classical computers can. 
And thermodynamics involves tasks similarly to the tasks of solving computational problems in information science. For instance, in thermodynamics, uh, the study of energy, we, we want to use energy to do things like power a car or charge a battery. And so we can ask, can we use these strange features of quantum theory in order to assist with those tasks similarly? So one thing that we do do is look around to see how we could use these quantum phenomena in quantum engines, quantum batteries, and so on. So a lot of the work is theoretical, but it's increasingly making its way into experiment. Quantum being mostly very small things are and and quantum computers being something that people might have heard of as well, but they're very much a in development, right? If you're talking about quantum batteries or quantum machines of certain kinds, where are those technologies today and how fast might they be in use by, you know, something you could buy at, at the Best Buy or the quantum computing store or this or that, right? Some quantum thermal machines, such as quantum engines, have been realized in experiments. These are pretty small scale. For instance, the one that I have in mind consists of, uh, loosely speaking, a, one particle. Also, um, require, to operate such an engine requires a lot of control, a lot of external apparatus, and a lot of care on the parts of the experimentalist to ensure that they get the engine to a very, very low temperature because quantum systems tend to exhibit their quantum effects just as at low temperatures. And the experimentalists have to take a lot of care to ensure that nothing is nothing undesired is interacting with the quantum system. The environment is very, very clean. And so it, it ends up in today's experiment, experiments that just performing the experiment costs a lot more energy than you can get out of the quantum, this eensy weensy quantum engine. So quantum engines certainly are not practical at the moment. There is what I think is a nascent wave within this discipline of quantum thermodynamics to start to take the results that have been in large part fundamental and of the spirit of exploring our world and figuring out what is truly quantum about thermodynamics and energy and how quantum physics differs from classical physics in the context of energy and transforming those fundamental results into really useful ones. So I have a couple of colleagues who recently put out some papers about taking energy into account when evaluating the usefulness of a quantum computer. I'm currently working with some experimentalists on a quantum thermal machine that should really be useful for people who are making quantum computers. Um, although my experimentalist colleague has asked me not to say too much more until the experiment is farther toward finished. So it's possible that they will become useful technologies. Do you look at that as the possibilities are endless? You know, do, do you look at that as if you know, this is a world of possibilities and everything is open and we just have to figure out where to focus our attention? Or do you think, how, how do you think about what to do next? Like what to, what to focus on at a given time and what to do next? I think that there's a great opportunity to make quantum thermodynamic technologies useful. We've so far identified a lot of situations in which quantum thermal technologies can be different from classical thermal technologies. And now we have to take the step of making that actually useful. But I think of this situation as similar to solar panels. Solar panels happen to be really useful in Southern California because Southern California happens to get a lot of sunshine. And if you have solar panels somewhere else, then they say in Nebraska, then they might not be useful. They actually might be a hindrance because they're just lying around blocking your way. So similarly, if you have a quantum thermal machine, then it can very well be a hindrance. You have to invest a lot of work and a lot of care and ensuring that it's separated from the environment and it's at a low temperature. But we might be able to find some nice sweet spots where the conditions are right so that we can put in some quantum thermal machine 
and it can naturally be useful there. So what I think of myself as doing is looking for places for quantum thermal machines that are similar to Southern California for solar power. And again, I think that we've identified at least one of those places. Uh, the, the experiment is actually supposed to start in a few weeks, so we'll see how it goes. Wow, that must be exciting. How does that feel to be uh, on, on the cusp of, 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 of an experiment like that? That's been really lovely. The, is this collaboration and working with experimentalists generally. At the beginning of grad school, I was very far in abstract theory land, which is a lot of fun. That's what I'm naturally drawn to. And I still really love working in abstract theory land. But it's also been really satisfying over the past four years or so to collaborate with experimentalists and turn that abstract theory into reality. For instance, today, um, a paper that I wrote with experimental collaborators in Innsbruck, Austria, just went online. There was an idea that I had with other theory collaborators in this discipline of quantum thermodynamics. We were thinking of a, a particularly quantum aspect of thermodynamics related to the quantum uncertainty principle. So we did some theory in 2015, 2016, which is a little while ago. And then it, it took a few years to translate that very abstract theory into something that we could even say was was reasonable to try to do in an experiment. And then these experimentalists in Austria said, we think that we can actually do it. And they managed. And so that has been a really satisfying journey. Sure. So is that a project that started before you started the book? Yes, so this, uh, well, there was the very early abstract theory paper that came out in 2016. And shortly after we came out with that, I, well, even before it was published, actually, I started getting pushback from the local experimentalist in, in a good way. As in he, he was interested in my work and wanted to understand why he, as an experimentalist, should um, be thinking about this idea that I, as a theorist, had come up with. So he challenged me to try to put the theory into more concrete terms. And that was really useful to push me toward thinking, how can this theory even look in our physical world? So even figuring that out, writing out the, the story and the description and the right math took a few years. And in 2020, I believe, I published a paper with some other theorists showing how to translate the really abstract theory into at least theory that described a potential experiment and wasn't quite so abstract, it was more concrete. And we found that um, our proposal for an experiment could take advantage of techniques that people in experiments using trapped ions or ultra cold atoms were leveraging. Then in 2000, uh, 19, so before this paper was actually published, um, I gave a talk at a conference in Toronto in which I laid out this experimental proposal. And fortunately, there was someone at the conference who was also giving a talk who was from this lab in Austria. And after the talk, he came up to me and said, I think I can do what you proposed. Then it took a few years for us to work out the details and then get the equipment in place and then have to stay out of the lab because of the pandemic and then go back and fix the equipment and so on and so forth. So it's been, it's been a little while. Uh, whereas the book, I started writing the book in, I think, August of 2020. So that was actually a much shorter project than getting this theory into experimental reality. And, and why did you decide to write a book about you know, all these, all these varied influences for, that have come together to, to f create this quantum steampunk idea and where it's going. Two reasons. One is because I'm a scientist and, and so I'm extremely excited about my science. I think it's one of the most interesting things in the world. So of course I want to share it. And second, because it ha this quantum thermodynamics, this discipline has this wonderful flavor of steampunk. So it has a lot of links in my mind, at least, to history and literature and uh, artwork. And so I thought that that's 
could be a wonderful opportunity for to engage with people who don't usually think of themselves as physics people or science people. I think that this discipline does have a lot of connections to other fields and other, um, say, other preferences. So I, I thought that this might appeal also to literary types and artistic types. And so I really wanted to celebrate the field and to elaborate on its really fun personality and to bring into science a group of people who might not usually think of themselves as science types. There, there's a little bit of a history of people putting up a little bit of a, a, uh, a stop for academic types to try to reach general audiences. Obviously, you think it's important. Why, why do you think that it's, it's an important thing to do? Yes, I actually was, um, when I started grad school, I was not expecting to write any books at any time in the foreseeable future, in part, not only because I needed to dedicate the overwhelming majority of my creative energies to my research, which I absolutely do all the time, but also because I had this impression that scientists look down on scientists who write for the general public. So I did a lot of asking around and was very grateful to find that it seemed that in most cases, or a lot of cases, the attitude has changed and it's really more of an, uh, let's say, I got the impression that it was more of a past attitude that um, scientists think it's not important to reach out to the general public. I, I've been very grateful that a lot of scientists have been really excited about my book and enthusiastic and looking forward to reading it and have also been really supportive of me personally. When I was writing the book, I admit I didn't tell any scientists more or less that I was writing the book until I was just about finished so that I could show this entire time I've just been my usual productive scientific self and I have a list of all the papers that I wrote and published at that time and many, many talks that I gave so I can show this book didn't take away anything at all from my science. On the contrary, it's been actually really useful for my science. There's a project that I'm working on now that came directly out of writing this book and writing this book has led me to learn a lot of quantum thermodynamics much better than I knew it beforehand. It forced me to do what I really should have been doing with some papers that I was reading casually to really think what are the basic physical ideas here? What is the basic physical story happening? When I talk to really great physicists about science, they talk in terms of the very basic physical story. That's what I tried to tease out from various papers that I was reading and what, that's what I tried to put into the book. So I think that it's important to tell stories about our science to the general public for multiple reasons. One of it, which it is, is it is really beneficial to us. Again, uh, this gave me great ideas. It helped me learn a lot about my own science. Um, it is exciting. So this has even increased my enthusiasm, enthusiasm about my own field. And then, of course, there's um, a need to give back to the taxpayers who are supporting our science and show them this is what we're doing. This is why this science is exciting. I've connected with students all over um, from the other side of the United States to Pakistan who have shared just lovely stories about what it means to them to see someone in science and hear about uh, this individual's uh, struggles and triumphs and so on. It can inspire a lot of people, regardless of whether they're in science. That's really interesting to hear. How do you, um, so I've never heard anyone quite describe the idea that when talking about a popular science book written by a scientist, that they are, it forces them to refine their own ideas so that they can explain it to somebody else. I think that's pretty cool. I've been very grateful for that effect. It's been very useful. And I've become conscious of it through writing for this blog, Quantum Frontiers. I got my PhD at Caltech at the Institute for Quantum Information and Matter there. My 
PhD supervisor was John Presco. John is an extremely accomplished theoretical physicist, and he's also very, well, it, relatedly, he's very good at explaining phenomena. So when there's some exciting new announcement from some collaboration that is probably going to win the Nobel Prize the next year, when we want to know what's really going on, we go to John, um, say at the lunch table for a really good explanation that he'll just tell us over lunch. And the reason that he can tell us over lunch is that he understands the physics so well that he can explain, he, he knows what to take away, what details are excessive. And so he can just explain what's really important. And then if we happen to be in front of a whiteboard, then he'll write down the key equations. He doesn't need to bog down the conversation with excess details because he understands so well. And it's because he understands so well that he can communicate well and that other people can understand him well. And so I've increasingly thought to myself when explaining physics and writing physics, would this, is this how John would explain it? Or, well, granted, I uh, maybe in some ways I'm kind of a kookier thinker than John is. And so my explanations wouldn't be his explanations, but are they of the sort that I could tell really well over a lunch table to students who want to know about the latest breakthrough? And doing that really forces me to figure out what's really important about the physics here and what isn't, and to sort out step by step what's going on. I want to ask about one aspect of the book that certainly caught my eye. And uh, you, you start each chapter with a little snippet of fiction. How did you get inspired to do that? That came from an article that I wrote for Scientific American uh, within the past couple of years, right? It was in, it came out in spring of 2020. A lovely editor at Scientific American reached out after coming across some of my writing. She asked if I would like to write an article for the magazine about quantum steampunk. And I was thinking about how I would introduce steampunk. And I thought, well, why don't I write a snippet of an imaginary steampunk novel? So I, I wrote about the early, some of the early factories in, a, in London and a gritty London night and this spirited heroine who is walking along at night and sees the evil villain with his dirigible in the sky to just introduce the idea of steampunk, but also play with some common steampunk tropes. And that was a lot of fun. So I figured, why not do it even more throughout this book? And I started developing a small cast of characters, and then they came back later in each chapter or in a number of the chapters to help explain some of the concepts in information science. And so in the intersection of information science with quantum physics, we often explain what happens in a physical scenario in terms of characters. For instance, we might say in the context of information science, um, imagine that Alice wants to send a message to Bob over a channel. How efficiently can she send this message? What if the channel is noisy? How much information does he get? And then there's also often an Eve who is eavesdropping on the channel. And so we tell stories in quantum or in cryptography about Alice, Bob and Eve. And sometimes Alice and Bob have a friend, Charlie. And I didn't want to use the same old names that scientists use again and again. So instead in my imaginary steampunk novel that's in the book, I came up with Audrey, Baxter, Caspian and Ewart. So that I could replace those names with some nice Victorian names. Any chance we're going to get a follow-up that uh, tells us more of their story? I currently don't have plans to write a steampunk novel, but if any literary agents who specialize in fiction read this book and would like to invite me to write a steampunk novel, then I would be interested in hearing from them. I want to ask one more thing about quantum steampunk, which is how many other people are using this term? As I've started up my group in Maryland, I received a lot of emails from prospective uh, graduate students, I, I think maybe some undergrads and prospective postdocs saying that they want to work in quantum steampunk. So I, 
I've been hearing it around. There was also an article in, I think it might have been physics today within the past couple of months or so in which that term is, was used. So it's, it's starting to percolate out. How does that feel? I'm very enthusiastic. I, I think that the term captures a lot of what's um, really enchanting about the field and very full of adventure. And um, it is, this field is full of adventure, kind of full of romance. It's a field that has been just blooming over the past few years. And so it's been gathering a lot of momentum. I think that it has a bright future. I think that term captures this entire atmosphere. And I'm, I'm excited to see the, the term take off. Your book, Quantum Steampunk, Physics of Yesterday's Tomorrow, comes out, is it April 12th? Yes. Okay, well, I want to wish you luck with that. And thanks for coming on. Um, really enjoyed talking to you, Nicole. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And thanks, everybody, for listening and joining us. This has been Inside Science Conversations. Please like and subscribe. Listen to our other episodes. Watch them on YouTube. You can find us on your podcast apps or at insidescience.org. I hope you've enjoyed the show. It's been a lot of fun to get to talk to different people, and we've had a lot of conversations that I really enjoyed, and I hope you did too. I want to thank the team at Skystorm Productions who helped us put this together, especially Ashley. I want to thank Karen Heinemann from the American Institute of Physics. And I want to thank AIP for supporting us to do this project. And I want to thank people for listening. Check on Twitter to see if I've got new stories or anything at C underscore Gorski, G-O-R-S-K-I. Take care.